Hey, my name is Leah Buffo. I'm a postdoc at NTU, and today I'm going to present part of my PhD work and some of my more recent work about ocean bottom seismometers for passive acoustic monitoring of baleen whales. I'm going to try to answer how can OBS contribute to understanding baleen whales. Cetaceans are divided into two groups. You have odontocetes or tooth whales that goes from common dolphins and belugas to killer whale. And you have baleen whales, which encompasses all the larger whale species that prey on krill and plankton. Among baleen whales, the blue whale is by far the most mythical creature. Largest animal on the planet, farmer of the sea and indicator of the health of our oceans. This is the species I'm going to focus on today. This is a representation of our current understanding of blue whale's migratory map, representing both feeding and breeding grounds. As you can see, they are spread across all oceans. However, until the second part of the 20th century, blue whales have been extensively hunted for their grease by the commercial whaling industry and almost brought to extinction. So there are only a small number of individuals that are scattered across wide areas, therefore visual monitoring is limited. But blue whale produce loud, low frequency sounds and therefore Passive acoustic monitoring has now been used for a few decades to study blue whales. It is autonomous, continuous, can be long-term and large-scale. This graph is from a review that was out in the end of September. They looked at 166 studies on the topic of baleen whale passive acoustic monitoring that were published between 2000 and 2019. The graph shows the different types of instruments used for passive acoustic monitoring and shows that most of the long recordings that they classify as big data are issued by bottom-mounted hydrophones. Collaborations between the bioacoustic and geophysical scientific communities expanded the possibility of using OBS for the passive acoustic monitoring of the low-frequency whales. Here is I represented on a map a review of all the passive acoustic monitoring based studies for blue and fin whales from 2000 until now that were published in JASA. Most of the studies focused on data from the hydrophone. These OBS recorded data sets used all the tools of passive acoustic monitoring detection, localization or distance sampling, tracking, distribution patterns, etc. The RAMRAM experiment was deployed at that location in the Western Indian Ocean. It is a location of prime interest as a part of the first whale sanctuary established by the International Whale Commission in 1979. The collected data was used to conduct the second long-term blue whale passive acoustic monitoring study in the area. It is worth mentioning the other, the Oasis Bio Observatory, which has been continuously recording data from the sound fixing and ranging channel since 2010. For the Ram Ram project, 57 OBS were deployed on the ocean floor, covering an area of 2,000 per 2,000 km square. They recorded continuously from October 2012 to November 2013. This project aimed at imagining the mantle structure beneath the western Indian Ocean and the dynamics of La Réunion volcanic hotspot. The analysis of the data from the circle stations revealed the presence of different baleen whale species. Whale populations are acoustically distinct and the characteristics of their calls show really well on spectrograms. From the most local species to the most widely spread, you have first the Madagascar pygmy blue whale that is today considered data deficient by the IUCN red list. You can see on the spectrogram the frequency as a function of time and hear the associated sound behind my voice. Next, we have the pickle that is made by an unknown singer and that has been recorded both in the Western and Eastern Indian Ocean. Last but not least, we have the Antarctic blue whale that is critically endangered and that is the most widely recorded blue whale vocal signature in the Southern Hemisphere. As you can see from those examples, calls are stereotyped in terms of frequencies and duration or pattern and in the way they are regularly repeated. 
these stereotype calls are believed to be produced only by males, while all individuals, male, females, and calves, produce slightly higher non-stereotype signals. We can build up long-term spectrograms, as the one displayed on the screen, that shows the recording from one OBS from an entire month, the month of May 2013, and then using the information of the characteristic frequencies, we can interpret the variation in this soundscape. Notice that in addition to the whale signals that I previously described, this representation shows some broadband signal that is marking the presence of anthropogenic noise emitted by ships passing in the vicinity of the sensor. Global migratory patterns state that blue whales spend the austral summer feeding in Antarctica and move to higher latitudes in the winter. From the long-term spectrums, we looked at energy variation in the species-specific frequency bands, and we were able to draw distribution patterns. Madagascar pygmy blue whale were present in the southwest of the Romrom network from March to June, and with signal recorded in time from south to west. Peacals were only recorded on the southeastern stations between April and December. Signals were coming from the south. Antarctic blue whales were recorded from February to October on all stations from south to north, but signal was recorded a bit later on for a shorter period on the westernmost OBSs. We look closer at finer patterns from a part of the network with a higher density of sensor, the Western Indian Ridge Array, or SWIR. There, the sampling frequency of 100 Hz and the intersensor spacing of about 20 km is ideal for the study of blue whales. However, the sampling frequency is not high enough to look at signal produced also by females and calves. This is a 15-minute spectrogram of a cold series from an Antarctic blue whale that is estimated 5 kilometers away from an OBS of the swear array. And this is how it looks like when the whale is about 100 kilometers away. So as you can see comparing those two pictures, signals are modified by the propagation channel, by multipath and attenuation, and the background noise is constantly changing. In addition, there is a huge amount of data to analyze, as for example, one month of continuous data on all the OBSs of the swear array is equivalent to about 6,000 hours of recordings, and so potentially contains a lot of calls at various SNRs. This is why we need robust automatic processing method to perform detection with known performances. This was the main objective of my PhD. I adapted to the passive context a method called the stochastic match filter, which is an extension of the match filter. And so I'm going to show you some of the results we obtain on a series of low SNR Antarctic blue whale calls. Notice that there is a strong seismic event in the middle of the recording at about five minutes. Here, in blue, is represented the input signal, the same as the spectrum, but bandpass filtered between 15 and 30 Hz. The red triangles are manual annotations of the calls. The signal reconstructed at the output of the stochastic match filter is shown in yellow. You can see that each call is reconstructed and that the seismic event that is there considered as unwanted noise is not picked up. The yellow output is correlated with a synthetic Z call, so Antarctic blue whale call, to provide detection peaks. Then peaks above a certain threshold are considered as detection. Characterization of the performances of the detector against different threshold and at various SNR has been performed, and the complete method is reported in this article. The time of arrivals associated to the stochastic match filter detections are exploited to measure time difference of arrival between the OBS of the sphere array and by comparison to theoretical ones, retrieve the animal's location. Here you can see an example of the trajectory of an Antarctic blue whale through the sphere array. The localization method is presented in the displayed publication. 
For the rest of the presentation, I would also like to show you that a lot can be done with the hydrophone of a single station. When we look closer at recordings from a single sensor, we can see more than one path of arrival, as here there is a replica of the call that arrives about six seconds later. Now, if we consider the different acoustic path between a source that is close to the surface, as blue whale have been observed to vocalize at a depth of approximately 30 meters, and a bottom sensor in a deep ocean environment, arrivals can be described as two coherent group of arrivals, one that can be considered as direct, that is represented here in white, and one bottom surface reflected, represented in red. The time difference between those two groups of arrival can be used to estimate the range of the source. The signal is reflected on the surface with a change of phase, which generates interferences known as the Lloyd's mirror effect. In that configuration, it is range, source depth and frequency dependent, so it will vary between call units. It can increase the level of the received signal up to 6 dB, but in case of destructive interferences, go down to the infinity. Note that for close range, this reduction of level occurs around 30 meters, which is assumed to be the vocalizing depth of the animal. We exploited this information to retrieve acoustic diving profiles of an individual in the vicinity of the sensor, working at the two characteristic frequency of the call, hence the two colors on the graph. Depths are within the expected ranges, and the whale returns regularly to the surface for breathing, and here the small oscillation between the two units could be attributed to fluke movements. Note that each unit's depth is quite stereotypical. Compensating for the Lloyd's mirror effect, we also separately measured source level. This work, prepared for JASA, is currently under review. To conclude, uh, when the chosen sampling frequency is sufficiently high, OBS provide high-quality, long-term data that are incredible opportunity for the study of baleen whale in all oceans. As we've seen in this presentation, this opportunistic data set can be used for passive acoustic monitoring. They can help mapping baleen whales' migration routes and occupation from detection and localization. They can improve our understanding of behavior and help elucidating the biological functions of vocalization through source levels and call patterns, for example. Because detection ranges are well defined, OBS can also help animal density estimation or even counting individuals. And finally, they also provide a new perspective to the study of the impact of anthropogenic noise on marine mammal. Thank you for your attention and don't hesitate to ask your questions.